thrilled to be with you today. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural session of Transformation. Uh, I am the Director of the Digital Impact and Governance Initiative at New America, and I'm coming to you from the very elaborate broadcast facilities located in the Tilleman household. Uh, we are going to embark today on one of the most important journeys that any of us uh, will ever set out on, and, and that is to figure out what we want our world and our institutions to look like on the other side of this crisis. We have with us some of the best people on the planet to help answer that question. We are extremely fortunate uh, that they are spending some time, taking time out of incredibly busy schedules uh, and crisis response in many cases to think with us on this critical subject. I'm gonna introduce them in just a moment, but before I do, I want to take this opportunity uh, to introduce all of you who are joining virtually and welcome you. Uh, I have the advantage of having seen the of a formidable bunch. We have secretary generals uh, of major international institutions. We have CEOs. Uh, we have an incredible array of talent uh, from state, federal, and local government in the United States and around the world, uh, and key leaders from multilateral bodies like the United Nations, the Community of Democracies, and the World Bank. We want to take this moment to create some community because this is a time when we really need community to solve these problems. But for a variety of reasons, it's harder than it normally is to, to cultivate that community. So if you are willing, introduce yourself in the chat, let folks know that you're here. Uh, we hope that you'll be able to interact in the chat alongside the conversation. And we're looking forward to your input and your questions as we talk today. I want to begin with a necessary but painful acknowledgement, and, and that is that we are in the midst of a pretty unprecedented crisis. Uh, the death tolls that we are experiencing right now, if you look back through much of April, exceeded what we saw at the peak of the D-Day invasion uh, during World War II. Uh, we had a, a dear friend that we uh, found out last night uh, lost their father. We've had members of our family uh, on ventilators. This is a, a disease and a, a crisis that is hitting many people all over the world, uh, regardless of where you are or your circumstances. It is, for that reason, an unusual event. We don't have that many truly global uh, crises that hit people all over the planet, and this one falls into that category. What we have seen historically is that when such an event occurs, and you really do have to go back to the Second World War to find something of comparable magnitude, it tends to have a profound impact on the shape of our institutions on the other side of the event. Uh, if you look in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, we had the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions like the World Bank and IMF, the United Nations system, and global architecture that really defined the way our world has operated for the last 70 or so years. We don't know what is going to happen on the other side of this crisis, but I would suggest it is almost inevitable we're going to see some big changes. And to talk through those changes, what they will be and what we should aspire to as we are thinking about what we want our world to look like. Uh, we have some of the top technologists uh, in this country and, and on the planet. Beth, I'm gonna start with you. And uh, Beth was previously the Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States. She is currently the Chief Innovation Officer of New Jersey. New Jersey has been hard hit by this crisis. Uh, certainly within the U.S., uh, one of the states that has had the highest caseload, but you also have responded forcefully using technology and innovation, uh, and your team in particular has developed about a dozen platforms, I've, I've lost count at this point, uh, that are being used in crisis response. Tell us a little bit about whether you know, my framing comments are accurate. Do you think this is a change? Uh, this is an event that's going to prompt big change on, on the other side. And to the extent that is what we're going to see, what should we hope for in those changes? And, and how should we utilize technology to get there? So Tamika, thank you very much for having me. And let me agree with your assessment to begin with that no matter how much we do, we should not be pat patting ourselves on the back. Last night, I had an experience I never thought I would, which is that I attended a Zoom funeral for someone in my family who died of coronavirus. So uh, that was quite surreal, I have to say. And we are seeing so many people suffering 
um, that there's nothing we can do that's enough to alleviate what's going on. That said, there are definitely, you know, in the midst of flying the plane and re-engineering the plane as we try to fly it, as they say, there are some key lessons learned, uh, I think, that are beginning to emerge, or at least that we're seeing from the work that we're doing. You know, the first is definitely that the perfect is the enemy of the good. And agility, especially in moments of crisis, is really crucial. Um, we were able to execute, in many cases, a very rapid response. So, for example, not just standing up an information hub around, the, uh, uh, around all things coronavirus, but also within 72 hours, creating the first uh, jobs hub in the nation to post now what's over 50,000 uh, jobs in essential businesses so that those people unemployed can actually try to find some work and some response. So doing that, key was repurposing technology that already existed. Key was setting up a very fluid content creation process across agencies to ensure that we had uh, the fastest way possible to post content that was actually accessible. And I would just quickly cite a couple of other, I think, important, important things um, that went on here. Um, key to this was also collaboration. Collaboration, first of all, across government. So right now we're working with the federal government, with the US Digital Service, for example, and the state's Department of Labor and Workforce Development on uh, fixes to the UI system. It's also about collaboration across state agencies. So working between our office, for example, and um, the Department of uh, Human Services to actually make fixes to the SNAP system so that we can more easily provide food benefits to people virtually and uh, fix what are otherwise paper-based requirements in an environment that now needs to go completely digital. It's also collaboration with the private sector. We worked with a company called YEX to stand up the information portal, covid19.nj.gov. Um, if you take a look at that covid19.nj.gov, you'll see, and then you look at covid19.alabama.gov. Um, Actually, I'm going to have Jordan put up a side-by-side, -side. Jordan, if you can help us on that. We'll, we'll come idea. back to that. In a state of eight and a half million people, we have five million users for that website. So it's really been kind of um, an incredible effort to get that, uh, to get those things stood up, which we couldn't have done without that collaboration. Partnership with universities has actually been key. So it's working, for example, with NYU and a variety of other universities on robust data analytical and predictive analytical um, uh, responses. It's working now with the State University of New Jersey at Rutgers and its School of Public Health to stand up public tracing efforts. It's working with Princeton University to help to develop the content for these websites and edit it and uh, rely on students and faculty uh, from around the is not only the state and the country, but also around the world where we're pulling in rapid expertise. And finally, the last thing I would put on the list is also the importance of responsible and rapid data sharing. Um, so the ability, for example, across a Department of Health, an Office of Emergency Management, the Innovation Office, to be able to share common data about what is the state of our PPE, you know, where are the masks, where are the ventilators, where are they needed? You can't get things from A to B if everybody's not working off the same page, doesn't have access to the same data. Um, you know, it's sharing data among, uh, you know, economic development and the Department of Labor and the Treasury Department to ensure that when we put out grants or loans for businesses or for individuals, that we're doing that in as a responsive as way possible. So I think what we're seeing in terms of innovations by way of better uses of data, better uses of collaboration, are things that I hope don't go backwards um, uh, uh, because we've seen really tremendous productivity as a result of those innovations today. So let me pause with that. Fantastic. Jordan, we can go ahead and take the slide down, but I want to, in uh, turning to you, Brian, talk about this theme that Beth raised. Uh, first, one, one thing to get out of the way at the outset, uh, 18F is a really unusual organization. You guys are kind of the, the pointy end of the spear when it comes to digital transformation for the U.S. government. Tell us a little bit at the outset about what 18F is and, and what it does and, and your role uh, as, as director of that organization. But then also I'd like you to dig in on this idea of open source and reusable code that Beth alluded to. And we saw there the side by side, some, uh, something that was built by New Jersey, a really useful platform that was creating value for their citizens, was then taken and utilized by a totally different state uh, and saved them a huge amount of work because they were able to adapt the open content that New Jersey had created uh, and deploy it much more rapidly. 
18F has been a leader uh, in that approach to developing government technology. Tell us a little bit about what that looks like for you. All right. Um, thanks again for having me. Uh, great to be here with such an impressive panel. Um, 18F is a part of the Technology Transformation Service within uh, General Service Administration. It's about six years old. Um, and our mission is to develop partnerships with agencies to help deliver uh, exceptional digital experiences. Um, part of that is not just being, let's say, uh, first responders to a, uh, a failing um, system, if you will, but more so to help that organization build capacity, right? So uh, work with them side by side on agile practices, the benefits of open source, and, uh, you know, for a while, we're, we're there in the driver's seat and, and they're with us in the passenger and then we switch, right? So we're there really to build capacity. Um, right now, we're working with a variety of agencies, um, state and local governments as well, uh, through a discovery, right? Validating that um, the problem that they're trying to face is, is uh, actually a problem and making sure we validate that first and then doing some experimenting and iterating and prototyping to make sure we can get them some value quickly. Um, in, in response to that problem, right? And actually bringing their organization and their engineers and their designers along with us as we go. Um, in regards to the importance of open source, um, it, it, it's extremely critical, especially in a time like this. Uh, um, 18F has had their hand in um, creating open source uh, solutions for things like the college scorecard. And we recently uh, uh, released an eligibility API for SNAP programs as well. And some of the benefits to this is that you can <clears throat> make a solution once and use multiple times. And these APIs can integrate with a variety of different solutions, no matter which one that a, a state or local government is utilizing. So it really <clears throat> allows for a good use of the taxpayer dollar, right? Rather than creating the wheel multiple times, industry partners or even these uh, engineering organizations in these state and local governments can hit the ground running with a, with a common foundation. So um, just like the great example that Beth showed between um, the state of New Jersey and Alabama and, and, and their common use of a platform to get uh, COVID information out there, um, that's, that's just a true example of the benefit of open source uh, technology and code. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to turn to Sheila in just a moment. Before I do, I want to ask our audience to weigh in on uh, something. As we think about open source solutions, and you know, again, both Brian and Beth gave us great examples of, of what these look like, we've started surveying the landscape around the world and trying to figure out what an open source government stack would entail. How could you redesign the way our institutions operate in order to give them the best possible chance uh, at assembling the right mix of services to deliver value for citizens and frankly ensure that they can respond much more effectively to future crises. One of the things that we have seen in the case of the pandemic is that almost without exception, the governments that are doing best right now, places like South Korea, Estonia, Taiwan, run their institutions on world-class digital infrastructure. And so we're interested in hearing from you in, in the audience what you think the priorities should be for digitization uh, as we get to the other side of this crisis. And we're gonna put up a poll now. If you can take a moment and let us know what you think government should be focused on. We will come back with the results before we wrap up today, uh, but we'll also take your input uh, and factor it into our planning for future discussions so we can make sure uh, we're focusing on the right things. Um, Jordan, while uh, we are turning to Sheila, I'd also ask uh, if you could share the blueprint slide uh, that we have so that people can get an understanding of what we're talking about, uh, because it's crucial for people uh, to think not just about a specific system, which is how we've tended to deal with these issues in government in the past, but more holistically around how different pieces fit together. How can you use identity and payments and data wallets to create a foundation for a whole suite of services that will work together more efficiently in the future? 
With that as backdrop, Sheila, you have one of the most challenging and fascinating portfolios of anybody I know. Uh, you work with the World Economic Forum, uh, which is kind of the, the pinnacle of international bodies charged with solving really complicated multi-stakeholder challenges and getting government and the private sector and civil society to all work together on, on big complicated issues. What are you seeing as it relates to the use of technology to respond to this crisis, particularly around uh, decentralized technologies like blockchain and data, uh, which is the portfolio that you lead for the WEF? Thanks, Tamika, for that. Yes, we are certainly seeing an increase in the deployment of technology in a very rapid way to address this crisis. And there are a couple of things I want to I want to talk through. Uh, one is we are really faced with a critical challenge when it comes to balancing uh, safety and surveillance systems, privacy and thinking about some of these individual rights and how that's fitting into the need to do more active surveillance of certain populations. Uh, and in this case, those populations have been dramatically expanded. There was a, a note someone gave to me that said that basically in the city of London, even before the pandemic, there were maybe four feet of space outside where you were not being recorded by a camera actively. I'm not sure if that's a true statistic, but it's certainly uh, in the ballpark. And the fact that I believed it, I think says a lot right there. There's no question that's happening with more and more frequency increasingly around the world, whether it's something like location data being shared by a phone carrier in order to effectively uh, do location limitation for track and trace. Uh, all these things are coming, I think, a little bit to a head. But what they're fundamentally about, I really think, is data. How do we think about data in this new world? Is data as private as we ever pretended that it really was? What would it mean to kind of open up massive pools of data to governments or even to private sector players to facilitate ending this pandemic, which is something everybody wants to see happen. So in those places, we're seeing less friction than you might think because of the need for urgent response to this crisis. And the concern is what the implications are over the longer term. So on that topic, if you look at the technologies that are going to get us out of this, obviously you have vaccines and antibodies and there's amazing work going on in, in that field. But immediately below vaccines and antibodies, it's contact tracing, it's digital identity management, uh, it is more effective use of supply chains, as Beth mentioned. It's a whole host of core digital tools that you know, a while ago, a few months back in, in ancient history, would have been seen as amenities. And now all of a sudden, they are necessities. Are you and the WEF seeing a drive on the part of governments to adopt those solutions? Uh, you know, I, I was having a chat with, with Beth a little while ago and she said all of the self-censorship that governments normally engage in is gone uh, when it comes to the use of these tools. Um, what's the trajectory gonna look like going forward, Sheila? You know, I, we certainly are seeing more interest in technology for sure. Now, I would say that that was always a little bit uh, under the under the surface. You know, I don't think that that is necessarily new. I think that there's just the people, those voices within governments, shall we say, are getting uh, more attention now because of the need for this. And in some cases, to be fair, you know, they were proven right. I think having more advanced technological solutions, as you noted, in certain countries, having a more robust digital infrastructure has been helpful in combating this crisis. I think that we can take that as, as sort of gospel at this point. Uh, and there is certainly a feeling that there's a need to catch up for those who are not in that space. Now, we uh, issued very recently out of, uh, out of my team a uh, responsible deployment of blockchain toolkit focused exactly on Beth, what Beth noted on supply chains. How might a ecosystem-wide blockchain uh, tool have really facilitated all kinds of changes that we could have needed. How could we have made our supply chains more agile, more flexible, more resilient? I think there are a lot of uh, these questions that come up. We, I, I will emphasize that what we do think is really important is that technology needs to be deployed very thoughtfully, and that is not easy to do. It takes a careful consideration, particularly with something like a blockchain or a distributed ledger, thinking through what players ought to have what access for how long, to whom, some of these decisions are very hard to undo. And it's certainly the case that even things that may be very responsible in the short term have longer term implications, again, like I noted, and they can become these embedded default positions that really were not what we intended. 
But we're seeing, to answer to the question, interest in certainly in blockchain and blockchain architecture, in new data architecture forms like data trusts and different ways of holding and managing data, particularly our digital identities. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, facial recognition technology is becoming a, a lot of interest. And I would also add in a virtual uh, and augmented reality. I think there's a lot of interest in public education uh, at, at the university level and some of those tools and how they might, if they were able to be engaged with cheaply, uh, could actually facilitate an, a, a sort of a more of an in-person feeling learning experience. So Beth, I want to pick this up with you uh, because one of the big challenges we find, and, and Sheila alluded to this as well, is that governments, at least in the United States, and I know you've advised other very privacy conscious governments like Germany as well, are not really equipped to share information effectively across agencies in most cases. And that is a challenge under normal circumstances. It means that a lot of people uh, don't get access to services and benefits as easily as they should. And uh, in many cases, uh, it can call, cause some, some pretty substantial inconvenience because we're left to fill out the same form seven or eight times. But right now, it's a matter of life and death. And, and the fact that we are not able to share information responsibly and appropriately across government agencies is having devastating uh, implications for not just the economy, but for lives. Do you think there's room to look at new models? Sheila was alluding to this. We have seen, for example, some countries and Germany is experimenting with this around contact tracing, uh, but there are some even more elaborate models on the, the horizon where individuals own their own data and they serve as the hub for that data and they're able to share it across government agencies. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one way of doing these things. But what are the solutions that we have not deployed in the past that we should think about using in the future? Oh, so I think uh, you've all mentioned a number of instruments. I mean, I think, you know, it has to start first and foremost with the cultural change that you're alluding to. And I think the experience that we're having now, um, first in terms of more use of data and more public use of and reliance on data than ever before is a very important step in the right direction towards actually identifying the governance mechanisms and the underlying architecture that we need to do these things. So I think the fact that the public has come to demand, uh, you know, daily doses of data in terms of the reports that uh, leaders are displaying every day, whether it's, you know, the sad cases of deaths or hospitalizations or number of people on ventilators, the uh, acculturation towards predictive analytics and the understanding now of the need to predict the flattening of the curve and what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, I don't think we've ever seen an occasion in which people have come to rely on or realize the public benefit of data and data sharing. And I think the transformation of attitudes is going to be extraordinarily important. Sheila's named a number of the mechanisms, whether it's now we're seeing things like what we at the Governance Lab call data collaboratives or public-private data sharing across organizations. We've done a lot of work with the WEF actually on exactly this topic of private sector companies supplying data for public good, whether it's their predictive models, the uh, you know aggregation of data across states, showing uh, transportation and movements, showing spending patterns, all of that's coming from private companies. Um, also, again, the sharing of data across agencies, you know, to be able to answer questions like, what's the impact of the virus on people of a given race, of a given socioeconomic status, of a given you know, category, that often requires looking across agency data sets. Um, and people are coming up, frankly, with very quick and dirty ways to do some of this work. And that often involves, again, another key thing, which is sharing talent, not just sharing data and sharing infrastructure, because to do that work and do it quickly, we would not be able to do the work in New Jersey that we're doing today if we didn't partner with a huge team, frankly, of data scientists um, who are actually able to do that work. Uh, I should say data and social scientists who are able to do the work of looking at a whole variety of factors on a daily basis. I mean, the talent, we have some great talent in our epidemiological team. Um, but, you know, everybody's flat out and the need for just more people and more eyeballs and looking at more models, even to come up with what the right models were in this case, that was not obvious from the get-go. And we saw a lot of uh, challenges with some of the models that in the first, you know, few days people assumed to be the de facto model. 
for predicting the curve didn't turn out to fit the data, didn't turn out to fit the progressions that we were seeing in the US, and there was a need to develop new models. Anyway, so sharing of talent, I think, is as important as sharing of data and creating the infrastructure for that. But the cultural change we're seeing is, I'm hoping, going to put things um, uh, in the right direction and, you know, has created the awareness that we all need to be working from the same playbook. And, you know, to Sheila's point that we are going to have to have very hard conversations about the need to share data with public health authorities, especially in order to solve some of these problems. And one of, let me just um, wrap up my two long remarks by saying that one of the things that's getting lost in my view in a lot of this discussion about privacy um, is the question about, you know, yes, we're worried about the hacking and yes, we're worried about the abuses, but we also have to be looking at responsible and ethical uses by public health authorities, for example, by epidemiologists to actually do the work we need them to do and how do we actually create those protocols and develop the governance for doing that's a hard question. So Brian, I want to dig in on here and, and I'm hoping you can uh, assist us in, in making this really granular because this is crucial. Um, Aleem Walji, the former CEO of the Aga Khan Foundation, sent in a, a question and he said, what should we be uh, applying from the Cambridge Analytica crisis uh, and, and scandal as we think about these issues? You know, how should that guide uh, how we think about personal data and how we balance the need for digital surveillance uh, with personal privacy? You're in the trenches on this stuff. You're actually building solutions. Your team is doing this work in real time. What should we be worried about right now? And what are you telling your teams to worry about right now so that we don't have another Cambridge Analytica crisis uh, in a couple of months? Because I think that is a real concern for a lot of people that the data and the information that is being provided is going to end up being misused in ways that are going to have devastating consequences alongside the initial impacts of the virus and, and the economic fallout. Um, one, that's a really tough, but an also great question and something that we consider and think about uh, often, right? I think um, foundational to how we operate, uh, we really take a human-centered design and a user-centered design approach to anything that we build or any solutions or recommendations that we make. And um, not all data privacy and data governance is created equal. So depending on the agency we're working with and the organization, really getting, um, getting to know them, their needs, their mindset at the time, um, how much data that they're willing to share. Um, is the solution so critical that, uh, <laughs> that speed is like their preference over, over privacy or something like that? I think really taking that human-centered design approach um, and getting to the understanding and the needs and the concerns of the people that are actually going to be utilizing the service and the solution um, is, is key to really answering those questions. That makes good sense. Mm -hmm. Sheila, I, I want you to help us zoom back a little bit because you have a very global perspective and, and certainly Beth and Brian both deal uh, in international realms as well, but you know, for you it's your bread and butter. The US, when it comes down to it, is really bad at this stuff. And it's kind of painful to admit it, but we are nowhere near the front of the class. What lessons are you seeing from other parts of the world that we should be applying right now, uh, both on questions of, of data privacy, but more broadly, what are the things that other places are getting right that we're getting wrong, but we can fix if, if we make some adjustments? You know, I get asked this quite a bit uh, by different uh, leader, government leaders in different countries about, you know, what are the portable lessons? And, and I, I want to go back to Beth's point, which is culture is such a critical component to this. Measures that were you know, easy to implement, for good or bad, but they were easy to roll out in uh, places like um, China, even Taiwan, you know, South Korea, for example, they are measures that I think we can see the reasons why they would be very challenging with the American population. I think you're seeing a certain jurisdictions within the United States that are more, let's call it compliant, uh, or, or more willing to um, put faith in government institutions than others. And this is, you know, this divide is, is historical to a large extent, right? Uh, it's nothing that we all didn't, couldn't have seen coming. 
So it's quite challenging to imagine how a, a, a solution that was working in another country could kind of be ported in. So I, I want to start with that frame. And that goes not just for the United States. I think it goes for really any country. Taking into consideration the cultural understanding about things like privacy, about the willingness to act in a collectivist manner, I mean, just as a political philosophy, are really important. Not to mention just the ways that people think about transit are very different. The way people think about uh, the employer-employee relationship are quite different in, in different parts of the world. So if, when you can control for that context to the extent that it's even possible, you know, and that's for others to weigh in on uh, than I, but to the extent that you could control for that context, I do think that what we're seeing is, uh, to Beth's point also, is the need to invest in talent for ongoing maintenance of systems. Because one major problem that we've seen, and this is far less publicized than other successes, as you might imagine, is putting into place, let's say in a municipality, you know, a, a great digital infrastructure, but there just is not the budget line to maintain that infrastructure. So the upgrades don't happen. This is when things like hacks often take place, not exclusively, Hackers are very creative, but oftentimes it's because suddenly a budget line got cut and then the maintenance around a particular stack, element of the stack, suddenly went away and the next thing you know, right? So it's thinking very long term about how you're going to keep up whatever it is you roll out. Okay, so those are sort of two, they seem very not really responsive to your question, but I think they're so important to think about. Um, and specifically, I would say, I think that one of the things that needs to be done immediately is thinking about this data architecture question. In, ex immediately experimenting with things like data collaborator, data collaborators, data trusts, et cetera, because if you don't have that piece fully in place, and if you don't have the ability to securely hold, process, analyze, synthesize the data that you have in, we'll call it a data lake for the sake of being as broad as possible, uh, the rest of it is kind of meaningless. You can't really run a meaningful machine learning algorithm on junk data. So how are you ensuring that what's going in is accurate? What's going in is actually uh, device uh, sensitive, so you really understand where it's coming from. And then you have the ability to hold that securely and deploy it, cut, slice and dice it the way that you need to. So everything else comes next. We're gonna come back to the data question in a moment, but I wanna pick up on something you said with, with both Beth, uh, Beth and Brian. Beth. You mentioned this earlier as well. It is impossible for New Jersey to do what it needs to do with the, the work uh, force that you have available. There are just too many challenges that need to be addressed. We've had a couple of really insightful questions about how you create the right partnerships and the right forms of collaboration to build these solutions, because this is a, a skill set that if we're honest, and you know, all of us have uh, at various points spent time uh, working in and around the public sector, is not native to a lot of our public sector institutions right now. You are a master at this. How do you leverage the capabilities of civil society, universities, the private sector, in order to build this stuff quickly and build it right? And, and is there a playbook that others can seek to emulate based on the work that you have uh, done so far? Brian's smiling. Is that because you have the play? You have you written? Have you have the playbook? <laughs> if you've got that checklist, <laughs> we're, we're gonna get, we're gonna uh, ping Brian on this next. Uh, yeah, so he'll uh, be in the hot uh, seat momentarily. So let me um, first let me just let me just pick up one quick thing to add to what Sheila said before, which um, which is that this also requires moving everything to the cloud. So from a tech infrastructure perspective, to make these governance decisions, uh, and especially if you want to talk about collaboration across whether it's agencies or with the private sector or whether it's with universities, if we don't have a ground source, ground you know ground source ground source of truth. Um, and the ability then to, you know, fix those problems with the data, clean the data, be working from the same data to ensure privacy permissions and security, but also to be able to decentralize control. Um, you know, public health for us, for example, is a highly localized affair. So we need to be able to work with local health departments, but we all still need to have the same data. And so the problem of legacy systems and old databases um, coupled with lack of talent is one of the things that impedes the collaboration that you're talking about. But to your point about collaboration, it starts, of course, with a willingness and the ability and willingness to say, we don't know and we don't have all the answers, as we all know. 
Um, and in this crisis, frankly, there's so much need that I think people have been very willing to put their hand up and say, we are thrilled for the help. So when a U.S. digital response comes along or a U.S. digital service or an 18F says, hey, we're here to help you, people are super eager. But I think where, um, you know, to the extent to which you can deem in any kind of success, um, you know, is having what I would call a broker, a broker. So whether it's an innovation office like ours, whether it's a new America, which often plays this role and does surely in, in work that we're doing um, in, in, in many ways, um, whether it's something like the work they've been doing in the city of San Francisco to essentially literally write the playbook for brokering uh, and connecting the demand to the supply. It's not enough to say, hey, here's a bunch of engineers or here's a bunch of data scientists because the people on the government side, you know, have to be able to shape the demand. You have to be able to shape the project to say, these are what the milestones are. These are the deliverables that we need. This is the time frame, you know, and then it helps, the, it helps everybody on both sides of the equation. If you have somebody who essentially serves in what we might just call a project management role to kind of define and scope the project in the way a good product manager product or project manager does, um, and somebody to serve that function is extraordinarily important. And especially with academia where, you know, I wear two hats. Um, we're wonderfully lucky that the data scientists we're working with are people who have worked with government before and understand that we need things in 24 hours, that we need things, you know, in a certain way, that we need them, you know, how to deliver, um, and that we need the things that we're asking for, as opposed to the things that will lead to the academic paper that you want to publish. Um, and that's not, and it's not self-evident for everybody because there's a lot of cultural divides to cross, a lot of vocabularies that are different. So having a broker somewhere in the middle is really important. And I think that's where an 18F, a USDS, a USDR, a New America comes in. Brian, help us a little bit to understand this translation role, because this is something we encounter all the time. The communities that you need to mobilize to solve these problems speak different languages. And part of the, the role for an organization like yours or an organization like ours is we are oftentimes literally translating the vocabulary between different groups that want to solve the same problem but don't know how to talk to each other. Tell us how that is playing out in your experience and, and how do we accelerate that process going forward uh, in a post-pandemic world? Um, that brokerage role is key not only from translate translation of language, but also um, from the perspective of scoping a project as well, right? Scoping and prioritizing. Um, I actually had a, a virtual coffee yesterday with a colleague in, in the Colorado Digital Service, and he spoke to about different collaborations and partnerships. And one of the challenges that actually arose there is, hey, we have so many different projects that we can tackle. How do we scope them and align them to the skill sets that we have readily available is one thing. But also when you have so many volunteers, there's a, there's a key hurdle that I think also needs addressing and that's uh, the clearance, right? There's, there's so many folks that are interested and have the skills and the talent and the desire for that mission oriented impact in their local community. But the clearance is a hurdle for them to be able to get access to the systems that need fixing or need scaling. And by clearance, right? to be clear, you mean security clearances. A hundred percent, yes. Yeah. Yep. So um, there's, there's a couple things that I think we can look at in, in this regard uh, in, in terms of getting uh, government, state, and local agencies uh, the help that they need. Uh, the thing that I've been seeing is um, these organizations uh, sometimes have both, but one or the other. So either they have a great functioning HR organization where they can hire the talent that they need to address the concerns, or oftentimes they might have a great acquisition shop that can scope a document and, and put a contract out there and get some support in. But I think what's critical on both sides is um, coming up with more so a modular uh, fashion to do this rather than specifically on the acquisition side, rather than a multi-million dollar contract to do a thing, how do we uh, uh, scale the scope down so that we can get value quicker and prioritize what the most urgent need is right now uh, that needs to be addressed and fixed? And I think you could sort of do the same thing on an HR uh, you know, talent search sort of perspective, right? Rather than trying to get all of the skill sets, what are the core functional skill sets that you need right now to address your most pressing concern? And um, 
Yes, uh, I was smiling before Beth because this is something that 18F uh, practices and we even support this on the state and local level in regards to agile acquisition so that they can get the support that they need quickly rather than taking an approach to sort of boiling the ocean and doing a multi-million dollar engagement. We often say that uh, in these projects, the technology is the easy part uh, and the hard part is everything around the technology. How do you get the right people? How do you get the right practices in place in order to ensure that uh, your beautiful tech platform is actually going to do what you want it to do and help people in the way that you want it to, to help people? Sheila, to that end, you and your team have been hard at work, and we know because we've been uh, fortunate to help you a little bit, uh, on something called the Presidio Principles that are going to be uh, appearing shortly uh, that go to some of these underlying questions about how you build more responsible technology solutions and how you can create decentralized systems that are going to avoid some of the really crushing, devastating shortcomings uh, that we have found with the two existing models that we're stuck with right now. One being kind of an authoritarian model where government has panopticon surveillance powers and can see everything. The other being uh, kind of the vagaries of big tech where you have uh, you know, a single company or a handful of companies uh, that hoover up everything for monetization purposes. And what we're finding you know, in, in the context of those two paradigms is that citizens and individuals are often left by the wayside and their concerns aren't being addressed. Tell us a little bit about how you have rethought some of those challenges and, and what we should look to incorporate in the systems that we build going forward on, on the other side of the pandemic. Yeah, thanks to Micah. I'll talk a little bit first about the general work we do out of uh, the forum in this area. And then I want to speak about Presidio principles and thank you for your unbelievable support of these, uh, not, uh, not small by any stretch of the imagination contributions. So the forum really looks at this exact question. How do we think about tech governance in ways that are going to lead to enhancing the positive impact on society? And what policies need to accompany any sort of technical deployment to ensure that we are embedding in those practices, we're making those practices habits, we're making them defaults, so that these deployments wind up mitigating risk, but also accelerating benefit. And the Presidio principles are an instance of that. So we have a global blockchain council that uh, has been meeting now uh, almost for a year, actually almost exactly a year, I believe. And that is comprised of leaders such as yourself who are thinking about the use of decentralized systems, uh, both from government perspective, from the protocol perspective. So we have people there working in some of the major protocols that work in Bitcoin, that work in Ethereum, uh, that work at Zcash, things like this, uh, but also from big companies, banks and others that are considering using these technologies, whether for uh, payments or currency or for data, for the trans transmission of data, you know, for supply chain purposes, for example. And when we met uh, for the first time, we were really thinking about what would be valuable output of a group like this, a group that of highly opinionated uh, people from different sectors, different countries, strongly held views on what blockchain should be for, what it should not be for, what it's capable of doing, what it's not capable of doing, uh, views that were deliberately selected to be in conflict with each other to you know, surface consensus, which as you know, is Make your job really easy. <laughs> Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So pretty quickly, we had this notion of a blockchain bill of rights, because to your point, with these emerging technologies, we have opportunities that we didn't really have. We have opportunities to learn from some of the things that happened, whether deliberately or inadvertently, around that kind of shareholder extractive type of model, and think a bit more about what the forum calls stakeholder capitalism. How do we embed a bit more of a participatory model into some of these technologies? And of course, blockchain, for those who are familiar with it, is really un almost uniquely designed for exactly that. So the principles lay out a set of values. They're a values-based document. They have six, 16 principles, and they're oriented around four categories that I'll quickly run through, because I think they're applicable even beyond uh, blockchain deployments. Transparency and accessibility, agency and interoperability, privacy and security, and accountability and governance. And in each of these four areas, we're launching them tomorrow, I should note, they're actually, we're very excited that they're finally gonna get released into the wild tomorrow. Uh, and in each of these four areas, we focused on what ought to be participant rights. What should we, if we really build in a user-centric fashion, what would that look like? 
they're aspirational. They're meant to kind of provide a North Star, a direction for build. But we think that things like this are going to become increasingly important uh, to think about, to build into your design sprints, to build into your QA process if you're a technologist, to ensure that at various points in time, you are really testing against an externally set guide in a way that's going to help you ensure that you're thinking as holistically as you ought to be about your deployment. And I'll say one last thing on this, which is that we think that the reality is that you can have as lofty a set of, you know, whatever you want, but it's individual decisions. It's a mindset and culture that every single day, you know, it results in these decisions being made. This is why people are so concerned about bias in developer communities and things like this implicit bias, because you only really do what you know. So we are encouraging individuals, not just institutions, to sign on to these principles, uh, to remind themselves, to hold themselves accountable to ensuring they're thinking about user-centered systems. They're thinking about, particularly with blockchain for this particular set of principles, they're thinking about the fundamental promises of blockchain technology and ensuring that whatever they're building on top of that technology is not basically bulldozing away all those benefits in favor of a more familiar system. Well, and, and the idea that individuals should own their own data, control their own data, they should understand how their information is being used in systems. A lot of these are at some level really basic and things that you would assume would be uh, kind of the norm and yet are truly revolutionary in the context of uh, the existing platforms that we're stuck with right now. Uh, it's, a, it's an exciting moment and we're eager to see the launch of the principles tomorrow. Beth and, and Brian, I want to pick up on some of the questions that we have heard uh, from the participants, and there are two big baskets that I'd like you to help us work on. One has to do, I think they're related, with disinformation uh, and the fact that there is a lot of noise, uh, both around coronavirus but more broadly right now. How do we design technology systems that help us uh, separate noise from signal? And especially as it relates to government's use of technology, how do we ensure that we are uh, guaranteeing accuracy uh, in, in the information that governments are utilizing? And then the second piece of this is how do we carry that into preparations for an election in November? Uh, how do we ensure that our systems are going to be protected what is uh, happening right now, both at the state and federal level, to keep our institutions and, and our uh, electoral processes safe and secure? Uh, I realize those are two challenging questions, but Beth, would you be willing to, to start us off on this? Sure. Um, well, to the first to the first question about uh, uh, disinformation, or at least just coherent and consistent information, I mean, I think that gets to the point, um, back to your first question, or very early on, um, the discussion about open technology. I think the importance of open content and content sharing is as important. You know, in this crisis, we've had to make do with technology, whether or not it's open source, frankly, um, in the interest of time. But really important has been open content and content sharing. I think establishing a process uh, for ensuring that uh, we have a consistent place where content is kind of um, collected, edited, frankly, just for accessibility so that it's written not in legalese, but in English um, and making it available to people has been really crucial. We created a project and as a way, the first project I think we did was not a thing we did initially uh, uh, for the state per se, but a project we did with the Federation of American Scientists called Ask a Scientist which is covid19.fas.org. That was a collaboration um, with FAS and a network of now easily, you know, six, 700 scientists who are helping to read, vet, fact check, research answers to scientific questions about the virus um, so that there's a people have, a, again, a good source of information. We then took that Ask a Scientist feature and put it into the state's website such that if you're asking a question about your unemployment insurance or when your child's school is opening, you're getting a, an answer from the state. If you're asking a question about whether you should take hydrochloroquine or whether you should drink bleach, uh, you're getting an answer from Federation of American Scientists who are in a good position to answer those questions. And again, to do so in a way that has high quality standards and research, everything is um, sourced footnoted and dated in terms of the answers. 
Um, so I think it's, you know, on the one, so I do, on the one hand, there's a kind of centralization that we were able to effectuate that helped us to coordinate that we were speaking with common messages, because again, things were changing very fast about where are test centers and who can get tested. You don't want different information on 10 different websites and people having to go look for that. You want a centralization, but at the same time, you want the bottom up benefits that come from things like crowdsourcing scientific expertise in the process. So the combination of a governance process to enable this to be decentralized, um, I think has been really crucial and ensuring then that we push that information back out using a widget so that other people can, uh, or an API so that other people can pick up and use those same features um, and disseminate them through their websites. Um, so I think that kind of open content creation process is kind of as important as the open source technology. It's you know what we might call open source content that's equally has all the benefits of lots of eyeballs, lots of bottom up um, creation, but some coordination um, as part of the process. And maybe I'll I'll pause with that and give Brian a chance. We can come back to the voting thing. Yeah. Well, and as as Brian is getting ready, I'm going to ask Jordan to put up a repository that we created uh, at New America in collaboration with a lot of your organizations uh, that takes open content and open source solutions from all over the world that are being used by institutions to respond to the pandemic uh, and makes them easily available, makes the code available, makes the content available uh, so that people can share them and, and benefit from that process more readily. It's a, it's a great uh, resource that hopefully some of you will be able to take advantage of. Um, but Brian, please go ahead on disinformation and voting. Yeah, I'd say um, one critical piece to add on to, uh, you know, best statements about governance and coordination and that open content strategy. I think one piece of low hanging fruit that could be um, a source of information and, and what sort of dis disinformation is out there is really that search analytics, right? What are, what are people looking for? Um, are they searching for Tynanol um, in response to COVID? And like Beth said, are they searching for bleach? And I think that gives the subject matter experts an opportunity to really dispel or even, you know, advocate for an alternative, right? So I think um, looking at that search data, seeing what's really on people's minds, which frequently asked questions are being hit the most, will allow the subject matter experts and that coordinated response to really take hold and, and, and shine light on what the truth is and, and the best practices. Fantastic. We are nearing the end of the hour and, and Jordan uh, had put up the URL for the repository on GitHub for those of you that are looking to take advantage of that. And I should note, uh, Brian, uh, that the uh, source code for the repository itself comes from 18F. So we thank you guys for that. It's been a, a very helpful resource. Um, but I wanted to come back to the poll that we took at the beginning and, and post the results of that poll, because I think they're instructive both uh, in guiding us as we wrap up this conversation, but also in shaping our discussions going forward. There's a big focus in these results on digital identity management. This is something, again, that in the US, we don't do a very good job of. There are other countries like uh, Estonia uh, and increasingly even places like India that have come up with some interesting solutions, imperfect, but still really intriguing. Uh, there's also a huge focus on benefits. One of the most exasperating elements of the last couple of weeks uh, has been looking at uh, people as they're told that they need to file for unemployment using a fax machine. Uh, and uh, the the gap between our existing government processes uh, and the tools that most people take advantage of and take for granted in their daily lives. Uh, and also a big focus, as we were talking about a moment ago, on voting and civic participation uh, and tax infrastructure. Uh, I will notice for the, the tax geeks in the crowd, we have an amazing event coming up on the 27th uh, in partnership with the World Bank, MIT, and our friends at EY, looking at next generation solutions on tax. Uh, we have an array of central bankers, finance ministry folks, uh, 
really, really smart folks from all over the world who will be participating in that uh, and hope that some of you will be able to join us for that. Uh, we also encourage you to use Twitter uh, to nominate individuals and topics that you would like us to address in future conversations. Uh, I have learned a lot from this discussion. We are hoping to keep them going uh, in the months ahead. Uh, and, and please let us know who you would like to take part uh, as we move forward. As we wrap up, uh, Beth, Brian, and, and Sheila, we are very grateful for, again, the tremendous insights that you've shared. I'd like you to hop into your time machine uh, and move ahead you know, somewhere between 12 to 18 months. I, I don't know exactly how far into the future. When some subset of us are gonna be sitting in a room full of governors and presidents and prime ministers and leaders from all over the world, as they think through how do we change things so we don't have to deal with this again. This was really awful. We don't wanna do this anymore. How do we change things so we're not gonna end up here again? What is your one piece of advice to that room? What is your one piece of advice when you are called on to speak to that audience uh, that will help us land in a better place on the other side of this crisis? Um, easy question, I know. But, uh, Sheila, we'll, we'll go to you. Yeah, I had a feeling it was going to be me first. Uh, you know, I, I, honestly, this seems so basic, but public health infrastructure. There are technical components to that. There are non-technical components to that. You can't defund public health and then be surprised when a pandemic catches fire in your, <laughs> within your borders. I mean, you can't have all those things at the same time. So investment in public health infrastructure, please, is what I would say. Brian. I'll go with uh, investment in public services. How do we make sure that those services are um, able to be accessed through digital means? Um, how, how, are, how do we ensure that they're scalable? And who within um, not only federal, but state and local are, who, who is accountable? For, for that experience. And Beth, take us home. I'll say uh, uh, responsible data sharing and use. That means unwavering executive support to all those prime ministers and presidents in the room uh, for da using data to govern in a more evidence-based manner and ensuring therefore that we build a cloud first infrastructure and the governance principles, but above all the culture for data sharing and data use and sharing of talent between government and academic and private sectors to allow us to make use of that data in order to create the public health infrastructure that Sheila was talking about. Uh, so that means focus on data. I've been reminded of watching all of this unfold over the last couple of months of a quote from Charles Darwin, who said something to the effect of uh, that when you're looking at which species survive, and thrive. It's not the most intelligent species. It's not the strongest species. Uh, it's the species that prove to be most adaptable. Uh, and I think that is going to be true for our institutions in the world that we face going forward. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be the biggest or the strongest institutions that create the value for their citizens and endure. Uh, it's the institutions that are going to prove to be most adaptable uh, and most effective uh, in deploying the array of new solutions that are available uh, to meet the needs of people around the world. The three of you are making that happen. You are helping to make our institutions more responsive, more adaptable, more effective. We are grateful for the work that you do in that regard. We are grateful to all of you who have joined us to participate in this conversation from around the world. Uh, Amel Karboul, a former cabinet minister from Tunisia, just uh, dropped a note into the chat. Uh, and she said that, you know, ultimately we need to ensure that education is, is part of the effort going forward. And I think conversations like this are going to be integral to that effort. Uh, so with thanks to you, with thanks to all of our participants, we will draw to a close now, but we hope that all of you will be able to join us in the future as we continue a conversation about how our world is going to transform and how you can help transform it in the months ahead. Thank you.